he tempted fate with his outrageous statements. I said, you know, I can earn it faster than I can piss it away. You should never do that. He earned and spent a fortune. I thought that it was great fun to have houses. Woodside, Aspen, Georgetown, and Paris. And stirred controversy along the way. It was uh, really one of the first pornographic games I ever saw. His ideas were ahead of their time. My question was, why do you want a robot to go get a beer out of the refrigerator? <laughs> Success came at a price. As corporations get bigger, you know, there's all the rules and the laws and everything that gets laid down that it chokes them, I think. And he was banned from the business he loved. I had no idea that I'd ever want to leave Atari. It just wasn't on my radar screen. But Nolan Bushnell is best known for creating a game that launched an industry. I wanted the ping pong game. I wanted to go. He grew up a Mormon in Utah, and he had three sisters, so he was the only boy. The only boy faces a painful loss at a very young age. His dad, who runs a construction company, dies suddenly, leaving Nolan fatherless. My dad and I were very close, and then I f kind of felt cheated. He was kind of launched into the position of being kind of the breadwinner and the responsible one. He didn't grow up with a silver spoon in your mouth. You just know that this is a guy whose own energy got him where he is. He works at an amusement park while earning an electrical engineering degree from the University of Utah. I was manager of the games department at 19 years old. I knew the economics of the game business. I've always felt that my work at the amusement park was my MBA. As technology advances, so does the curious young visionary. Somebody programmed a game called Space War, and that was out of MIT, and the Software was brought over to the University of Utah, and that was the first video game. And people say, gee, Nolan, you invented the video game. And I said, no, I didn't. Russell did from MIT. So Nolan Bushnell graduates and heads out west, where the magic is happening. I could hardly wait to get out of Utah. And if you're going to be an electrical engineer, and it's the late 60s, early 70s, you're going to be in Silicon Valley, in the center of the action. It's 1970, and he's working double duty. Engineer by day, video game creator by night. Nolan probably didn't invent the first video game. Nolan took it to the next level. He invented a technology that made it affordable to bring these games to arcades. Computer Space was the first game, and what I was trying to do was really bring Space War to a cost point. Computer space was a, was a monumental flop. It didn't make it to very many venues, and where it did make it, it wasn't very popular. All my friends loved it. All my friends were engineers. It was a little bit too erudite for the masses. With the aid of Al Alcorn, another young engineer, Bushnell sets out to make his second game, a game that sneaks its way into history. So I told him I wanted the paddle game. I wanted a ping pong. I wanted to go and the ball would go back and forth. But I had actually defined it so that there was a button. So you'd position it and then the button would swing a little racket. Well, Al got it to the point where it just had the two paddles and it was knocking the ball back and forth. And it was so much fun, I said, stop. We don't need to go to the next step. And so we did, and the rest was history. The rules for playing were quite simple. Insert quarter, the ball will serve automatically. Avoid missing ball for high score. We named Pong just because you couldn't own a ping pong game, and so we just truncated it and called it Pong. They are unable to raise any venture capital. 
And with no other option, Nolan Bushnell and partner Ted Dabney are forced to market the game themselves. So with very little money, they start their own company. We originally named the company Syzygy. S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y. Syzygy, Syzygy, Syzygy. No one could pronounce it. So we knew we kind of needed to change the name. We wrote down a list of names. And I remember that Atari was the third on the list. And I looked at it and I said, well, it's okay. <laughs> it's time to debut the game. And Pong is placed in a Sunnyvale, California bar for testing. When they called three days or two days after we, we put it in, there was a failure. We thought, oh, oh maybe, we maybe got a problem here. There was too many quarters in it, so it had actually jammed and it uh, shorted the machine. And that's a problem we can fix. <laughs> in November 1972, the fledgling Atari company ships its first commercial version of Pong. Shortly after, original partner Ted Dabney leaves the company. We also had no money, and we were making factories out of, you know, old roller skating rinks and various things. So, but we were scramblers. They were also frisky young things. They'd have their goals to shoot for, and then when they'd reach them, they'd have huge parties. Almost everybody went home with everybody else. It was a loose atmosphere. I think that Nolan ran it more like a hippie commune than uh, it probably should have been. It was, everything was consensual and, and everything, So, but it was a it was a really, really different time. But the flip side was, it was a very creative environment, and a lot of good and interesting product came out of that environment. And the product, a simple yet enchanting game, is a hit with men and women. It became socially acceptable for a woman to challenge a man to a game. Probably several hundred people have said, I met my husband, wife, playing Pong. <laughs> In 1973, sales at Atari reached $3.2 million. While they awaited patent approval for Pong, others seized the opportunity. We were heavily, heavily copied. It was a very successful game, but there was TV Tennis, Winner, um, all the big Chicago factories came out with a version. Another innovative game from Bushnell raises lots of eyebrows, but very little money. It's called Gotcha. It was uh, really one of the first pornographic games I ever saw. Everyone was talking about the phallic nature of joysticks. And so we thought, well, maybe it would be good to have two big pink rubber controllers on the face of the game in which the, you were manipulating breasts. Some people went for it, some people didn't. Nolan was creative, there's no question about it. Meanwhile, nearly 100,000 Pong-like arcade games are produced, yet Atari sells only 10,000 units. Nolan continues focusing on a series of other arcade games, but profits plunge as Bushnell pins his hopes on a home version of Pong. Consumer Pong. Everyone says, well, you know, it was, boy, what a great idea, da, da, da. We took it to the toy show in New York, and we sold none. Zero. So we went to the... TV appliance stores, we sold none, zero. And so you say, what am I going to do? By 1975, Atari, the precarious video game company founded by Nolan Bushnell, has experienced failure and incredible success, including the much-copied Pong. But Atari's eyes are on the future, and their next venture is to bring Pong into our living rooms. But video game companies slam their doors on Nolan and his idea. Everybody just, they, they, didn't, they didn't get it. They didn't, uh, didn't like the sound of it. The head of sales at that time heard that Sears had put a consumer pinball machine in the sporting goods department. And so he called up the head buyer from the sporting goods department at Sears, and he was on our doorstep the next day.
Sears wants 100,000 home Atari games for its 1975 Christmas season. Atari sales rocket to nearly $40 million. At last, Nolan Bushnell experiences financial freedom. Well, maybe not. A growing company is actually consumes cash. You can very seldom throw off cash fast enough to grow as fast as you want to. So it was either take the company public or sell it to somebody with really deep pockets. Those pockets belong to Warner Communications. In October 1976, Bushnell sells Atari to the communications giant and personally nets a reported $15 million from the $28 million sales price. After years of struggle, Nolan and his family become the poster family for lifestyles of the rich and famous. I said, you know, I can earn it faster than I can piss it away. You should never do that. He enjoyed his toys, there was no question about it. And Nolan's toy box includes two private planes. Taking planes to go to have lunch. I remember arriving at a place and the door opening and diapers falling out. Sailing all over the place. I had a house in Woodside, a um, house in Aspen. It always sounded more, I think, more glamorous than it actually was. I had a house in Georgetown and I had a house in Paris. Nolan was a guy that wanted to play with his money. He wasn't a guy that was interested in making more money. The house in Paris was a simple little 15,000 square foot place in the park right next to the Eiffel Tower. Damn, it was fun. It was just fun. For Nolan Bushnell, the merger may have cost him his voice. Of course, after the sale, your bubbles get popped one by one by one by one. And a lot of your pet projects get killed because uh, they don't see the future. Atari continues to dominate the arcade business with popular titles that include Breakout and Night Driver. Yet there are now more than 70 versions of the Pong home game. But Bushnell has an idea, and it's called the 2600. In the home game business, we thought of a single game, and Nolan said, no, no, this is a business that we have to be able to, to treat it like a record player and put new records in. It's a revolutionary console that enables consumers to play multiple games. You can get nearly 300 different cartridges, 300. The day we shipped the first one, I told the guys at Warner, I said, this product is over in three years, or four. It's amazing. Nolan feels suffocated as he butts heads with his corporate bosses. As corporations get bigger, there's all the rules and the laws and everything that gets laid down. That it, it just ends up kind of it chokes them, I think. And they just didn't see it. They just didn't see it. Demand for the new console is weak, and Bushnell's unhappiness reaches a peak in November 1978. I felt that the company was taking some foolish risks. At the same time, I felt, I don't know, I, I, I kind of didn't, didn't like working for somebody else. Nolan's exit as head of Atari is quickly arranged, but a document he signed two years earlier would haunt him. The non-competitive agreement bans him from the industry he helped create. When I signed it, I had no idea that I'd ever want to leave Atari. It just wasn't on my radar screen. It was only later on where I said, oh my, what have I done? Atari would go on to even greater success, but its founder, unable to work in the business he loves, has no choice but to shift his energy elsewhere. Nolan always uh, fancied himself as an entertainment guy, not as a video game guy. And by that time, Chuck E. Cheese was doing well. See, Chuck E. Cheese was started inside Atari. They didn't want to pursue it, and so I bought it out. It becomes the place that adults hate and kids love. Culinary aspects just didn't seem to matter to Nolan, and I think he's wrong. I don't eat at Disneyland. You know, I don't eat at amusement parks. <laughs> so, and Chuck E. Cheese was an amusement park. Kids don't like spicy. They'd just as soon have a plain cheese pizza. The chain becomes known for its arcades and animated characters, including its namesake. Can you say Chuck E. Cheese without smiling? Because we wanted the smile, Chuck E.
Chuck E. Cheese. We wanted to smile. We, we wanted this name so that you couldn't say it without smiling. But kids don't care about the bad food. They just want to play games. Chuck E. Cheese is soon franchised into 180 locations nationwide. I remember going to a couple of the openings. It was just fantastic. I mean, it was really a blast. <laughs> but Bushnell can't stay still for long, and his eyes once again lock onto the future. He forms a venture capital group that backs innovative ideas. Some say too innovative. There's shopping on computers. Try by video and enjoy the newest shopping experience. That was so early in the days of computers. The technology wasn't ready. We used laser disc players that in the early days of the laser disc, the machines were buggy. And automobile navigation systems. I felt that people could drive more efficiently. That was incredible. And we had those in our cars. And it would take a lot of stress out of driving. And I always thought, I, I don't know how I lived without this before. But his favorite and most enduring dedication to futuristic technology is the personal robot. Now, that was a fixation that I didn't share with Nolan. We joke, though, that I do have this robot fetish. I mean, I really love robots. And I've lost a lot of money pursuing them. My question was, why do you want a robot to go get a beer out of the refrigerator? <laughs> she says that she wants to put me in a robotic 12-step program. While Nolan concentrates on his robots, another venture is about to go under. His brilliance can at times be a distraction and can diffuse the focus of his attention. I had turned over the running of the restaurants almost eight months before that. And I'd been focusing pretty much on sailboat racing and the game side of the business and really not watching the pizza side. They tried to make the pizza better, I think, was a problem, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> like, it ended up costing too much money and kind of threw the whole business model out of whack. And they said, we're going to miss our numbers, but we're not going to just miss numbers, we're going to report a loss, which I thought was just absolutely impossible. You know, just not, not possible. mid-1980s, the innovative Nolan Bushnell has made and lost a fortune. Our family, we've really managed to kind of roll with, the, with everything. Like, we've, had, we've definitely hit, you know, some, some super hard times. The fact that Nolan has, it has had his ups and downs is one thing. Uh, Nolan deserves to be as economically successful as Walt Disney, and Nolan truly deserves more than what he has. His fascination with the future has cost him millions. In many cases, I read science fiction and looked at the world, and my objective in life is to try to make the world happen a little bit faster. Sometimes the world is ready and that the infrastructure is in place. Sometimes it isn't. Although his personal robots never catch on, Nolan's furry animated creatures do. Oh, I felt that there was a market for an electronic animal. The thing about a petster is it does what it's told. And so we created the petster line. And the AG Bear. That I really liked. The idea that a child could, you know, get a reaction from a teddy bear. I still think it's an incredible product. It was a bear that you could believe was talking to you. Hello, AG. I thought it was going to be successful, but I was surprised at how big a success it was. He sells more than $15 million worth of animated animals. But Bushnell's next robotic toy, Tech Force, launches a controversy. Signals controlling the robot's movement would be transmitted through a children's cartoon series. I think they felt that there was somehow something subliminal going on in which these controls, if they control the little guys, maybe they can control the kids. Maybe they can control us. I think that the whole idea that we can control things through the television set is frightening to a lot of people. The protests helped derail the Tech Force toys and TV show. After years of dipping into other creative ventures, it's time for Bushnell to reunite with his first love, video games. 
he becomes a consultant for Hasbro, Bally, and a string of other top names, including one with a rocky past, Atari. Decades have passed, yet three of Bushnell's early inventions are still alive and still evolving. Newly configured Chuck E. Cheese is a smash hit again. Atari is now part of the Infogram family. And Pong, the simple game that started a revolution, has entered a whole new dimension. But Nolan and his family have moved on to Ewink. We started this together. We are bringing the supply of simple games back. A new project that brings him full circle with a twist. Our games are very short form focused. They're all two and a half to four minute strategy parlor type games. People that don't even play video games get stuck on these. It's a new generation of video games to be played in public places. Let the interactive games begin. We make touchscreen tournament games for bars, restaurants, hotels, airports. So you put them in one of these locations and they dial up to the internet so we can download new games to it, download new trivia questions, and play the national tournaments. And we can do it economically through the internet. And that's really what we're doing here. Decades ago, Nolan lost a fortune when his landmark game, Pong, was copied by others. There is concern that it could happen again. It is my belief that Nolan's uh, biggest competition will come from competitors that he spawned himself who will take his good idea and take it to the next level. But Bushnell is already looking ahead. I'm still more focused on what I'm doing next. Like, this, the stuff that I'm going to come out with in the next two or three years is just going to knock your socks off. I already know about several other ideas um, beyond Ewink that he's got in store for the future, and he wouldn't retire. That's why he didn't retire back in the day when Atari was big and Chuck E. Cheese had made it. He enjoys the game. He's the perpetual optimist and like really excited all the time and it's impossible to get him down really i mean he's got like a it's fire from inside really nolan has pulled me in directions that i never would have gone and i've had experiences i never would have had and i think likewise well i've always said that it's been such a roller coaster but certainly not boring. <laughs> he is the guy that made the video game business. If I were to look back and talk to my kids and say, who founded this business, who made this business the reality that it is, it is absolutely categorically Nolan Bushnell. You know, life is interesting as you want to make it. And too many people just decide to sort of settle. As long as you're not willing to settle, you can constantly be pushing the envelope. And you need to be a really, really good beginner. Because if you enjoy being a beginner, then pretty soon you can start a lot of different things. And uh, I just feel like that's what I try to do, be an elegant beginner. <laughs>